we start off just by talking about sort of how this film sort of came to be, really, because um, we're obviously in a time where sports documentaries are quite popular again. And yeah. They've never not been. Um, but you know, obviously the, the, the Netflix Jordan and the Chicago Bulls yeah. thing, and then even down to like Sunderland <laughs> football club. Yeah, know, yeah. This has obviously got a different angle to it as well. But you know, how did it yeah. start start off for you? Um, well, it started about seven years ago. I kind of started thinking about this film in about 2012, the end of 2012, and uh, I'd always just wanted to make a long form something long form. My background's television, so I kind of have been working in television for the last. 15 or so years and was kind of like used to making short BTs but always had ambitions to sort of like make something a little bit longer and more substantial and I just I just gravitated to things that I was naturally interested in so I, I was interested in like trainers and and sneakers uh, but you know I'd never call myself a sneakerhead but I, you know, it was a sweet spot for me, uh, the Michael Jordan phenomenon, sort of like the uh, the fact that, you know, 35 years on, nothing has ever eclipsed, you know, the Air Jordan brand. So I, I was interested in that. And I was also interested in how come a story like this had never been told before. I'd seen stories about sneaker culture, but I'd never seen anything that was, you know, about Jordan's like Air Jordan basically and Michael Jordan's relationship with Nike so that's basically where it started I started thinking about that and then just you know this was a completely independent endeavor you know we kind of set about myself and the two producers uh Will Thorne and Michael Marden we just kind of like set about making making the film um we knew that it was going to take a, a long time and we were kind of comfortable with that because we were doing it by ourselves yeah. but I think also the luxury of time allowed us to make the film in the way that we wanted to make it I think if someone had given us a pot of money in 2013 and said you know make this film and deliver it by 2015 it wouldn't be the film that you watched on Saturday night after you put your kids to bed <laughs> so um yeah that, that's basically it and so, so you say you had time so uh did it evolve over that period of time? So you say you started off as like a, I think I read in the production notes about um, it was based around sort of collecting sneakers and mm. you know, that mm. kind of thing. Did it sort of evolve after you discovered different things through the people you interviewed and then obviously the facts you found out? Yeah, a hundred percent. I think, I think initially I was, uh, I was interested in making a film about collectors, Air Jordan collectors specifically, not sneakers uh, collectors, just Air Jordan uh, collectors. And, I realized that that perhaps wasn't that interesting um, just because you can find that stuff on YouTube. You can find like crazy collectors on YouTube. And I didn't think that that would basically sustain like a 85 minute uh, feature film, like narrative arc. So then I started thinking about, okay, well, what about, you know, the origin story of, you know, Air Jordan and, you know, uh, Michael Jordan's relationship with Nike and how that, you know, landmark endorsement deal all came about, you know, you could argue that without Nike and Michael Jordan, you wouldn't have all of, you know, the superstar athletes in, in Dolphin, endorsing sort of like athletic brands. So I thought that was a sweet spot and quite interesting. So I started pursue, I started to pursue that. I, you know, I wanted to sort of like tell the definitive uh, Air Jordan story. Um, and, and that's how it basically evolved. So it evolved from, you know, sneaker culture to sort of like the, the definitive Air Jordan story. Sure. Oh, and you briefly spoke about it there, but your personal connection to the, 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 the actual brand Jordan, well, I mean, mine was, uh, I suppose, being, I was in a very small uh, town in, in the west of England, you know, not yeah. like near the United States, but I remember the trainers, and it was very much a big thing at school, you know, and it was about, you know, what people had on their feet and that kind of thing. Mm. What's your mm. sort of personal connection from from when you were a, a, younger, a little bit younger? So well, It's pr pretty much the same. I, I remember the sort of, like, going to school. London and and not being a massive basketball fan but just being uh, a Chicago Bulls fan and knowing that you know they were they were basketball and Michael Jordan was a god of basketball I had sort of like a Chicago Bulls jacket and I remember that time in that period in terms of like my my connection to Air Jordan specifically it's you know it's very loose I, I knew that you know Michael Jordan had his own sort of like huge you know brand uh, with with Nike and and I knew that the sneakers were a part of that but I was never yeah I was never sort of like crazy about that in the way that some people 
like collectors and you know I was never that enthusiastic about it I just kind of you know admired it from afar and just knew that it was kind of incredible but that this guy had this series of shoes that dated back to like 85 and you know every year they brought out a different one and then also throughout the 90s the shoes that he kind of released coincided with with you know what he did on the basketball court in relation to like the rings and the championships that he won and I thought that was like pretty interesting you know um but and I think that's that's about it really cool and and, and what what makes you think they've been I mean it's 35 years I think since the first 34 years since the first one came. yeah there's been yeah. 34 editions am I correct in saying that yeah yeah um, yeah so what what's made it endure that I mean this I mean obviously he's, he's sort of inspired others to do the same I think I even owned a pair of Patrick Ewing's yeah, yeah, yeah. At one point, but uh, yeah. how, what's made the Jordans endure this amount of time? It's baffling, isn't it? I think it just comes down to the fact that Michael Jordan's the greatest basketball player ever, you know. And I think that as long, you know, as long as that stands, then you know this brand will continue to live long after he's gone, you know. And I think that everybody wants, you know, everybody always wanted a piece of of of. of of that magic you know you can't do what he does on the basketball court but you can be associated or you can own a little bit of or of of that thing and that was the trainers you know like he's 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 kind of producing these incredible moves he's doing this like out outlandish spectacular sort of like slam dunks and he's doing them in these shoes that you can go and buy and i think that's you know that's the connection and and that's why that legacy is is you know what it is today. I think it's just that people were uh, and continue to be enamoured by Michael Jordan and and the excellence of Michael Jordan. And I think everybody wants to be associated with that, no matter what. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about the style of the film. Um, you're a photographer as well. Um, I'm looking at your website. It's sometimes <laughs> um, oh, you combine that with sort of animation and. Um, mm. yeah, with the talking heads and the archive footage and all that sort of stuff, which is mm, great, mm. fantastic to look at. Mm. Is that something you had sort of road marked out at the beginning, uh, or was that something that came together when you were sort of putting the film together in the edit suite? No, no, we knew from quite early on that we wanted to tell a story that was, was kind of like multi layered from a visual perspective. I didn't, we knew that we didn't just want talking heads and archive because it just felt it might be a bit dull and not necessarily complement the pace and the personality of the film. So I'd always enjoyed uh, this idea of animation in, in documentaries because I think visually it's just quite uh, intriguing and, and interesting, you know? And uh, that was something we knew that we wanted to incorporate quite early on in the film. I think the first, the first trailer that I made, the first teaser trailer in 2013, 2014, I think was heavily influenced by that style and it had all of that in it. So I I knew from early on that I kind of wanted to make this, you know, multi-dimensional film that was just really rich in terms of, you know, what you're you're looking at. And I wanted it to sort of like sustain over like 80, odd minutes and, and and the viewer not get bored and just continue to be uh, stimulated and, and not just listen to an old uh, a group of like talking heads basically mm-hmm. and and just to match the tone and the personality you know because it's like 80s 90s America that was a crazier time and it had personality and it and I just wanted to punctuate that with the visuals and, and with the animation and then also just the fact that archive footage is really expensive you know so you've got to think creatively about how you can you know, just get around that by using other aids and other tools. And animation was definitely one of them. And it was something that we were thinking about quite early on in, in the process. Well, it looks fantastic. It was really, really good. And, uh, oh, thanks. Yeah, definitely style about it. Was there any oh, sort thanks. of massive kind of roadblocks in, 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 in the sort of the making of the film? Did you come up against any hurdles along the way? Or was it kind of, was there anyone you couldn't get but you really wanted, barring the not, <laughs> Um So I guess... So there's two questions there. So in terms of roadblocks, it's hard making an independent film. It's, you know, it's hard making an independent film when all of your, when all of your characters and all of your contributors are in another country, um, on another continent, basically. So I think that was, you know, we, we, we didn't struggle with that, but, you know, that kind of went into the fact that, you know, it took seven years to make. And then also, 
if you think about where documentary was seven years ago, it was a different, it was in a different place. I think now documentary has this prestige and, you know, it's not necessarily a dirty word anymore. And, and you don't associate it with kind of like, oh, it's going to be boring. It's going to be dense. I'm going to have to go, you know, it's going to be like doing double maths on a Friday or something. It doesn't, it, we, we don't, we're, we're not necessarily, um, in that place anymore documentary is rich it sits alongside uh, feature films narrative and so i think there was that in terms of people that i really wanted to get i, I guess only spike lee um he's the only person that i kind of we like we tried really hard but you know i think if you look at the third act of the film it would have we would have been hard pressed to get spike lee in the, in in the film just given the fact that you know, he's been a staple of that brand for so many years. And he's basically, you know, he like, you know, they built that brand off, the, off his back as, as well as MJ's, you know. So I think that he's been a pitch man for that brand. So I think that he might not necessarily have agreed or wanted to be associated with uh, uh, the third act of the film, which kind of probes and examines and dissects you know, the unfortunate legacy of this phenomenon and, and, you know, what it is, the byproduct of that. So, yeah, I was always quite realistic. We tried and we didn't. But again, he's, he's Spike Lee. He's an Oscar winning sort of like director. We, we're just some sort of like, you know, independent like filmmakers from South London. So, so yeah, we talked about the third act, which is obviously does change tone massively. Um, yeah. I, was, I was actually quite shocked by... Well, you... What was said? Yeah, I mean, I didn't know it went that that dark, to be honest. I mean, yeah. and it's still happening. So, did that surprise yeah, yeah. you, or was it something? No, different? no. I, I. This is the thing. I, I always knew, like you know, when I was sort of a teenager, I always was aware that sort of kids, you know, in inner cities got robbed and jacked for their rare Jordans, um, and. It, no, I it, I must say it didn't I it didn't not, that didn't surprise me because I knew that it still happened. I think that when I met Daisy, I I think that kind of really hammered home how like senseless you know those crimes are because it was you know that was her only son and just the way in which it happened and the fact that it still happened and I think it just felt like a case study you know. I, and and that's what we wanted it to be. I, I all I ever wanted to do with this film is just tell the the, the story of the Air Jordan sneaker. There's there was no agenda, you know. So, and I just always felt that unfortunately, you know, the the third act of the film is a an unfortunate you know legacy of of the sneaker. So it just felt that we it felt like a responsibility to cover it the best way that we can and just present the flat the facts and then just leave you know, just leave it at the viewer's discretion to, to make up their mind as to sort of like what they think. But yeah, it, it doesn't shock me that it still happens. But when I speak to people, they're always, when I speak to people of a certain age who remember, you know, the phenomenon from like the late 80s and the early 90s, and they kind of remember the fact that, you know, kids in New York on the subway used to get robbed. And then when you tell them in sort of like, you know, well, yeah, it's 2016, 20, 2017, this is still happening. And and that's when you see the surprise and the shock. Like, how can that still happen? But it it still does. Yeah, I think the, the other thing that also shocked me was the the, the lack of support from what I presumed is the lack of social responsibility from from Nike and and, and perhaps Jordan himself. Mm. So was that something that maybe sort of surprised you again? Is, is it or is it, did you approach them? I'm sure you approached them, but was there any response at all? Yeah, I mean, we approached them because I basically wanted to talk to people that were were involved in this phenomenon. So, you know, this is an origin story, essentially. And most of the people that were involved in that landmark uh, Nike, uh, you know, Michael Jordan deal have left the company. But there's like maybe two people that still work at Nike. And I was interested in sort of like talking to them. But you know, I wasn't surprised that I didn't get an answer because like I said, they're a multi-billion pound company and I'm a random guy from South London making an independent documentary. Of course, they're not going to reply to me. Um, but, you know, I, yeah, I, I wanted to talk to them about the legacy of the sneaker and I wanted to talk to them about, you know, this, this part of the sneaker's legacy. Um, in terms of like accountability, 
I, th I think a brand's objective is to make money, you know, and I kind of feel that they maybe look at these cases as sort of like really infrequent and really rare and it's not worth their 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 time to sort of like you know pay much attention to it but given the fact that i spoke to lots like a few parents who have unfortunately lost you know children uh to to this to this to this senseless violence you know i think all they ever wanted was acknowledgement that from from the brand that this happens um, because that's that's the thing that they never felt quite felt like that you know a sense of kind of like well condemn and condone this because it just feels a bit odd that you know you'll take our children's money for these sneakers but you won't call out the senseless violence violence that surrounds you know the the phenomenon and the legacy of these sneakers so yeah absolutely okay back on to sort of the film itself so you've seven years in the making um mm. And you're a, you're a South London uh, filmmaker, and mm. it's the London Film Festival, which must be uh, huge for you. I mean, for, for, I remember the first time I went to the London Film Film Festival, and it was yeah. just a journalist. It was phenomenal. So yeah. What was it like to be accepted as an obviously get your film in there? Slightly different times this year, but yeah, yeah. How, how how does the whole experience sort of sum up for you? Yeah, it's like really surreal to be completely honest, because I've been attending London Film Festival since I want to say two thousand and eight. Um, 2007 and it's always been one of my favorite film festivals and you know as a Londoner you sort of always dream to you know, have have your film selected for for a festival like that because it's top tier you know and there's not many top tier film festivals around the world so yeah it's like really surreal and really kind of not overwhelming but just yeah, I, I pinch myself that this is even happening, that I'm talking to people like you about this, you know, basically a labour of love. This was a passion project for so many years. And I think over the last couple of years, it came to fruition, but we just never really stopped working in, on it because we always believed that there was quite an interesting story and, and an element and a sort of like it covered things that people had never really explored um, in relation to this sneaker. So, yeah, like we're just really happy that it's been like received and people like it, seem to like it, so. Excellent. And in terms of the, um, obviously it's getting a cinema race as well, very soon over here. Mm. Uh, at the South News Day, obviously 130 cinemas are closing from, which is baffling to me. I, I, it's I, outrageous. I don't get it. Well, you thought I was gonna just ask for your sort of thoughts on that. So it is literally breaking news in the last couple of hours. Yeah, yeah, I, I just saw, I just saw it. I, I, it doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't, I think, you know, the arts, uh, you know they're, they're they're part of the fabric of society and they should be supported in any way that they can and the fact that so many people are potentially going to lose their jobs um just doesn't make anything it's a really dark day to be completely fair and to be completely honest it's just i don't know it's every day it just feels like something else you know so i i, I feel yeah i feel pretty dejected about the whole thing and and just like massively of thinking about the people that are no longer going to have jobs come the end of the week because of these closures. So yeah, I, I kind of feel that there needs to be a call to action. You know, I think the arts need to be supported in, 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 in the way that some other industries are being supported because they employ lots of people. And like I said, they're the fabric of our society and, you know, it's, it's, it keeps us all going. So yeah, I'm really, I'm really sad about it. And finally, um, obviously, the obvious question is: uh, you've obviously got like, this massive, excellent film out there now. Is this filmmaking the way you want to go forward in terms of feature films, and documentaries, or is it you've got something else on your agenda immediately? Or is what's, um, what's next? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I guess we just kind of want to continue to make films, to make feature length documentaries. That's always been the goal and the dream, you know. And I, and I kind of one man in his shoes was just meant to be a bit of a calling card. Like I said, I, this was an independent endeavor and we were kind of you know, aware that no one was gonna come along and give us a pot of money to make a film. So we just kind of did it ourselves, but we did it because we believed in the story and because we wanted to tell this story, but also we wanted to have a chance to tell other stories. So nothing on the horizon right now, but yeah, hopefully we we'll get another shot at it and you know, we, can, we can sort of like make other films basically. Well, I wish you all the luck. You deserve everything you get with this. It's um, it's brilliant and good luck. Oh, thank you so much. Good luck thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you.